one today at all of our locations. I hope you guys are having a wonderful one. Yeah. Uh, for those of you at 929, Kirksville, Hannibal, Pittsfield, Macomb, and for those of you gathered here in Quincy, I'm just so excited that you decide to come and worship with us here at The Crossing. What I want to do real quick before we go too much further in the services, I just want to pray for our, our Hannibal location. You know, they're getting ready to move into a new facility. They've got Easter coming up. And I just know, being a campus pastor myself, and when I was like in a, in a new church, that there's just a lot going on, a lot of things to juggle. And so I want them to know that they're being lifted up by all of our other locations. So would you guys pray with me real quick? God, I'm thankful that we get to be a part of one church in multiple locations. And God, I'm thankful that it's your church, nobody else's. And God, I just ask that you'd watch over all the people who are a part of our Hannibal location. God, uh, put a burning desire on their heart to reach out to people. God, help them as they're trying to finish the things that are on the to-do list that will enable them to move into their new location. But God, I just pray that they would do continue to do awesome ministry each and every single week until that gets here. We love you so much. In your name I pray, amen. Well, I don't know about you guys, but this sermon series has been a little on the convicting side. You know, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm like a professional Christian, right? And I'm, and I'm sitting there and I'm sometimes going, ooh, that hurts. There were like two moments, and I don't know if maybe they were the same for you as they were for me, uh, but a couple weeks ago, Jerry made this statement. If you're not fishing, you're not following. And I was like, ooh, that hurts, Jerry. And then last week when Josh said, we speak boldly about what we believe deeply. And if we're not speaking boldly, it tells us what we don't believe deeply. And I was sitting right in the front of Macomb and I was like, ouch, I'm gonna fix that. So this week in Macomb, I have been on top of it. Uh, I got a phone call from a funeral director in town. He's like, I need you to do a funeral. I'm like, okay. And as soon as I start talking to him and hanging out with him, I'm like, so where do you, where do you go to church? He's like, nowhere. I said, well, we're gonna fix that. And he goes, well, I don't know, man. I'm not coming this Sunday. I said, good, I don't even want you to come this Sunday, but you come on Easter. He's like, well, I don't know. I said, listen, man. You're gonna be there. He's like, all right, I'll talk to the wife. Then I see him and he's like, yeah, I talked to the wife. I said, well, what about your son? His son's standing right there and he's like, I don't know, that ain't us. I said, come to church. I'll, I'll take you out for lunch afterwards, whatever it takes. I want you to experience what I get to experience every single week. And he's like, I don't know, I'll, I'll think about it. I said, well, who do you know that comes to our church? And they start rattling off names. So as soon as they leave, I pick up my phone call all their friends that come to church. I said, hey, you give them a call. They're gonna feel like the hand of God's calling them. Like, why are all these people inviting me? I'm going through McDonald's, which is an everyday occurrence. It's bad enough that through the little microphone thingy, they can tell it's me, okay? Like I start ordering and they're like, Clayton, do you want a large Coke with that? Yes, I do. And I'll be back at lunch, okay? And so I pull up and Nancy's uh, inside the little window. And I go, Nancy, where do you go to church? She goes, well, I've been thinking about coming to the crossing. I said, well, stop thinking about it. Let's be about it. She goes, well, maybe, maybe I'll try and get there on Easter. I said, that, that's good enough. So then I'm in at the bank. I just made a commitment. I'm tired of feeling guilty when I show up for church. I'm tired of Holy Spirit's conviction on my life. And I said, you know what? If I have the expectation for the church to be talking to people about Jesus, I probably ought to be talking to people about Jesus. So I'm standing there and there's a guy who I've seen maybe 50 times, but he's never been in our church to like go to church. He's always been working, doing something for us. And uh, I said, where do you go to church? He goes, well, I, I, I don't know if you should go in there. I don't know if I should go in there. I go, why? He goes, I think it'll collapse on me. I said, I know plenty of people that it should have collapsed on and it didn't. And they keep coming to church, what's your excuse? And he goes, I go, and I, I go, come as you are. He goes, oh no, I got a nice suit. I said, if you show up in a suit, they're gonna think you're a first time visitor. <laughs> you show up in a pair of jeans and a cutoff and you'll blend right on in. And he says, okay. And then the person who's counting the money at the bank, she's like, she's, she's like counting it out and I'm not even paying attention to her, I'm talking that. She starts to count it all over again. I said, don't worry, I trust you, you'll be coming to church soon. So I've made a, I've made a commitment that I really do want people to know about Jesus Christ. And I've also realized this, that this body of believers at all of our locations is one of the best ways for them to get a picture of who Jesus is. 
by the way you love on them and by the way you care for them. So I just want you to know, I've been nervous before I've had those conversations, but I'm pumped. I'm excited because I can't wait to see what God's gonna do in every single one of their lives through this. I get to talk to you today about fishing, about talking to people about Jesus. And there's a really cool story in Mark chapter two. And if you brought your Bible, uh, you can go there. Uh, we're gonna be there in verses one through 12 all, all, all day. That's all we're gonna be. I'm not gonna make you jump around to other places. We're just gonna be in Mark chapter two. And this story is, it's convicting, but I also think there's like some really uh, funny things going on in this, in this story that I've never heard anybody else talk about. And maybe it's just I have a little bit of a demented mind, but I think you guys will enjoy it. Mark chapter two, verses one through two, that's all we're gonna read at the beginning. And when he, meaning Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. Somebody in Capernaum had it right that when Jesus is coming to town, you talk to somebody. I mean, think about how all those people would know that Jesus was in that house on that day. People were getting the word out. A recent uh, study shows that only 2% of church-going people invite someone to church in a given year. Let me say that again. Only 2% of church-going people invite someone to church in a given year. Now, I don't believe that statistic would be true at, at any of our locations. I think we, we really are an evangelist, but I can guarantee you there's always room for improvement, right? We can go, you know what, I don't wanna be a part of the 2%. I'd much rather it be like, 98% of the people who attend the crossing invite someone to church in a given week. Like that's what, I, that's what I'd like to have happen, but I know that it's gotta start with me first and it's gotta go to the people that I'm invested in. So we gotta start that together. But what would it be like if we were serious about inviting people to church? You know what we'd run into, don't you? There'd be so many people, there wouldn't be room at the door. Can you imagine showing up for church and like it's standing room only? To some of you, that might like be, oh man, I don't wanna be a part of that, but that's exactly where I'd wanna be. That means that the Spirit of God is doing something absolutely awesome in our midst. You know, the closest we're probably gonna get to that is next week, when more people show up for church than at any other time during the year. There's gonna be thousands of people hearing the Word of God. It's gonna feel like something absolutely awesome is going on because it is. It's because God's preaching the word through, the, through, through Jerry, through you guys, to make sure that people can have that intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And then I think to myself, you know, there'd be some people who'd be frustrated if they showed up and there was that many people. But I'm an optimist in almost every area of my life, except for when I look out and I see an empty chair. You can ask me how a service went, and I'll tell you it went great, yada, yada. I'll tell you the sermon was cool, the worship was great. But I look out, at, just like I'm looking out right now, and I see empty seats. And it breaks my heart. It really does. Because that seat belongs to somebody who, who could have heard about how God loves them. That seat belongs to somebody who could have heard that God's forgiven them. That seat belongs to somebody that might be going through a really difficult time and they could have heard about Jesus and how he could help. Like when I look out and I see empty chairs, man, it breaks my heart. And sometimes it breaks my heart because I know I could have done something to fill it. Now some of you might be going, well, if there was just so much room, if there were so many people, you know what we'd have to do, don't you? We'd have to go into another building campaign. And you know what I'm saying? Sign me up. There's times when I get tired of, you know, doing the XM thing. I get that. You know, you could buy a hot tub with your XM contribution. You could, you know, buy a cool shotgun. If you're me, that's what you'd do. You'd buy a shotgun. Yeah, you'd buy new clothes. I mean, you could do some cool stuff with your XM money. But I'll tell you what, I want to make sure that there's always room for my friends to know about Jesus through this body of believers. And I want to make sure that there's always room for your friends to know about Jesus Christ through this body of of believers, and the only time you gotta go through a building campaign is when God's doing something awesome in your midst. If you get to a spot where you're not having to expand your facilities and rearrange things in order to accommodate the growth, you don't ever have to worry about, that. you don't have parking lot problems when the Spirit of God isn't present. 
You don't have problems in your kids' areas because there's so many kids showing up when the Spirit of God isn't there. You see, I believe that God grows a church. That's what I really believe. I don't think, I think he grows it through his obedient people. But if you look around, you see the church growing, that's God. Listen to where God's heart is and see if you're in the same spot. First Timothy says this, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of our God and Savior. Hear this, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Peter says this, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Do you hear God's heart? He wants absolutely every single person to know about Jesus Christ. Absolutely every single person. So my job, your job, is to partner with him in achieving that goal. And we gotta make some adjustments. We're gonna have to make some sacrifices in order to keep up with what God's trying to do, but I know this much, I'm, I'm in. I'm willing to do it, whatever it takes. I wanna be a part of the kingdom of God advancing. And sometimes when I look at this passage, I'm thinking these people probably weren't being really articulate when they started talking to somebody about going to meet Jesus. That's probably what they just said, come and see Jesus. That's what the disciples did when they went out and got Nathan. They said, hey, you, you should just come and see this man. The woman at the well that we talked about a couple weeks ago, she didn't go preach a sermon. You know what she said? Come and see the man. Maybe how you could invite someone to church is saying, hey, come and, come and see the one who's, who's changed me. Come meet Jesus. He's changed my life around. Come and see. If you hate it, I won't bug you again. I might. But I, <laughs> come and see. Let's go on to the next verse. Mark chapter 2, verse 3. They came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. So I'm thinking there's like an entourage. And like four of them lost like the rock, paper, scissors on who had to carry the guy. Now maybe it probably wasn't like rock, paper, scissors. It was more like rock, papyrus, and spear, I guess. I guess that was, I don't know how they did it. But somehow there's an entourage and only four people, you know, they have to like carry the guy. Now, the guy could have asked. The guy could have, it doesn't say, but he could have said, hey guys, will you take me to Jesus but the story doesn't say that. So I always like to think that he didn't want to go. <laughs> They're just like, you're going. <laughs> Stop, I don't want to go. He's paralyzed. What's he going to do? They're just carrying him, you know? <laughs> Stop wiggling. You know, they're just carrying him all the way there. And those guys were just saying, you know what you need more than anything else? You need Jesus. More than anything else that you could get today, you just need Jesus. Mark chapter 2, verse 4. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, him being Jesus, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. First thing that like jumps out at me is these guys would stop at absolutely nothing to make sure that this man got to Jesus. Do we have that kind of commitment? I think sometimes we look for like an off-ramp we look for an excuse. We look for the slightest bit of resistance so we can just bail and say, I tried. These guys show up and it's so full that there's no way to get into Jesus. And they've, they've already made up in their mind, this guy is gonna meet Jesus today. So they end up on the roof, cutting a hole. Now, some people have tried to tell me that like, it was the first century and like it was a little bit more acceptable and I'm looking and I'm going, no, I don't care when it was. If you're standing there preaching and a hole starts opening up above you, it's gonna cause a stir. Can you imagine being the homeowner? More importantly than the homeowner's wife, I told you not to have Jesus over. Look what he did to the roof, right? Do you know how much that's gonna cost, okay? So these guys are up on the roof and they're cutting a hole and one of them, like if this was happening today, Imagine Jerry's up here preaching and like, first of all, imagine the place is so full. There's no room even at the doors. 
Then all of a sudden, you know, one of the guys is apparently like uh, Bear Grylls because he's got climbing rope on him, you know. He's got his North Face backpack and a saw, and he starts cutting a hole in the roof. Like, that's acceptable. And then they lower him. And I always think like the paralyzed guy's going, hey, 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 hey. You guys know I'm afraid of heights. That's how I got this way, right? And I can see the other people just kind of going, worst thing that can happen is we drop him and he's still paralyzed, right? Like, it's a win-win. So they're just kind of lowering him, hoping it works. Now, that's not, that's not us, is it? So committed that no matter what it takes, we're going to get someone to Jesus. I'll pick you up. I'll take you home. I'll take you out to eat. That every time they come up with a reason why they can't, you come up with a reason with how you'll help them make sure it happens. These guys are so committed to this paralyzed guy that they would stop at nothing. Then I also think that maybe there's something else inside of here that should frustrate us a little bit. You know, those guys could have just skipped the whole inconvenience of taking the paralyzed guy. They could have left real early in the morning and got a good seat in the front row but they were willing to be inconvenienced to make sure that that guy could get Jesus. Then I think about the crowd of people gathered around to meet Jesus. They wouldn't let a paralyzed guy in. How messed up in the head do you gotta be? That would be like someone showing up for church and all of the handicapped spots are taken and you're trying to bring in your friend who's in a wheelchair and nobody would move for you. You're so self, we're so self-absorbed. Those people were just so content on, I gotta get what I want and set and let other people have an opportunity to meet Jesus. Man, some of us, maybe we need to start sacrificing so that other people can experience what we have. Maybe we need to miss a service and serve back in the kids area so that somebody else isn't taking, so their kids are taken care of. Maybe we gotta take the, the bad parking spot a long way away so that somebody else can have a good one? What are some sacrifices that we're making so that people can come and meet Jesus? I don't know, but I know this much, that that's probably indicative of a person who's really seeking after Christ, looking after the needs of others. Mark chapter two, verse five. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed, or he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I'll tell you this much. I really struggle with this verse. I really do. The first part of that verse really messes with my head. Jesus doesn't say he saw the paralyzed man's faith. He says he saw their faith. And ultimately, I don't know really how to preach that. But I can at least tell you this much. When you're bringing someone to church, when you're bringing someone to Jesus, God is looking at your faith. And I think conversely, if we're not inviting people, if we're not reaching out to people, he's looking at our lack of faith. These guys are committed. Jesus sees their faith and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And I'm going, Jesus, are you completely oblivious to what's going on here? You just had a paralyzed man land in front of you. And the first words you're gonna say is your sins are forgiven. The guy's paralyzed. What's that tell you about Jesus? What's the most important thing that could happen to that man? Getting the forgiveness of his sins. Feeding the hungry is really, really important. What's more important? Making sure that people know that there's forgiveness for their sins available. Paying a light bill is important. It's not nearly as important as making sure that person knows that their sins are forgiven. Taking someone through marriage counseling, it's important but not nearly as important as somebody knowing there's forgiveness of sins. You see, Jesus knows that the best thing that could happen to that man is is he know that his sins are forgiven. The most important thing that could happen in your life today, the most important thing that could happen in the life of your friends is that they know that their sins are forgiven, that they accept it, and that they receive God's grace. That's more important than anything else that could ever happen to them. Because you, you can get a healthy diagnosis and still miss out on heaven. You can get a full stomach and still miss out on heaven. The only way to get into heaven is through the forgiveness of your sins. 
That's how important forgiveness is to Jesus. That when he's confronted with the paralyzed man, he's, he's passing over all the physical. And he's going, I'm gonna take care of the spiritual. This man needs to know his sins are forgiven. Now, it, it goes on. You see, the people around him are going, hey, by what authority is he pulling this stuff off? You see, it says, now some of the scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Around my house, if someone gets a bad attitude, we call it drinking the haterade. If someone starts getting real out of pocket, I'll be like, do you need to go to the bathroom? Because I think you've been drinking way too much haterade. If someone starts, I'm like, hey, you can't drive as much haterade as you've been drinking. You, you gotta stay home. People are always drinking the haterade, especially when it comes to church. They just can't help it. They just pull up and just gulp, gulp, gulp. Gotta have that high haterade. The sermon was too long. Gulp, gulp, gulp. But somebody else was changed by it. The music's too loud. Gulp, gulp, gulp. Gotta have my haterade. Somebody else connected to God through it. Had to wait too long in line for coffee. Gulp, gulp, gulp. Some people are actually being persecuted for their faith. Man, I have to sit in the middle aisle at church. Gulp, 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 gulp. Other people are serving in ministry while we're attending church. It's so easy to drink the haterade. I drink the haterade sometimes. I can make it all about me and miss out what, on what God's actually doing. The scribes just saw a man get forgiveness of sins, the opportunity to have eternal life, and they're going, hey, he can't do that. Drinking the haterade. We gotta stop doing that. And so we can start seeing what God's doing, because this is what I've noticed. If you drink too much haterade, you're gonna miss out on living water. You're too busy over here at the haterade cooler and you're gonna miss out on seeing what God's doing in people's lives and you're gonna miss out on what he could do in your own life. Anytime you read a story in the Bible, you do not wanna line up with the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and the Sadducees. You wanna avoid that at all costs. If you wanna find yourself in the story, be the paralyzed person. If you're gonna find yourself in the story, be the person who's sick. Be the person with whatever problem. Just don't end up being the scribes, the Pharisees, teachers of the law. Now, here's where it gets crazy. Mark chapter two, verses eight and nine. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your, sons are, or your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now, to some of you, that passage of scripture is like, like aloe vera on a sunburn. It is just so soothing, it makes you so happy. You're going, Jesus knows what's going on in my heart. You may be trying really, really hard to do everything that God's asking you to do. You may have had a couple bumps and bruises along the way, but you know that God's seen your heart and seen that it's pure and that you're trying really, really hard to, to live the life that God's called you to. I mean, there, there are people in here that that's comforting to know that he knows the pain you're going through. He knows the sorrow. He knows the loneliness. He knows the brokenness. He understands the confusion. He knows what you're going through. That's one of my favorite things about Jesus is he knows. See, he's not concerned with the outward appearance. He's concerned with what's going on in your heart. And for people with a pure heart, man, he's just going, I get it. I'm gonna take care of you. But if you wanna know where I end up, I think this is one of the scariest verses in the Bible. Because I can act like everything's cool. I can act like I've got it going on. I can act like everything is okay, but God knows what's going on in my heart. Man, those scribes, they were sitting there dressed nice, looking good, probably sitting in the front row. Everything was just right, but in their heart, they were, 
They were questioning what God was doing. They were frustrated by what God was doing. And I see that, that's me. If you wanna know where I am, that's me. Sometimes I have to ask myself, God, is my heart just really right before you? Because when I think God knows what's going on in my heart, I start getting sick to my stomach. Like, man, am I a poser? Am I a fake? See, when Jesus is looking at your heart, man, if you're pure in heart and you're going through a rough spell and things are just challenging, but you're really trying hard, God sees that. But when you're faking, trying to make it look like you got something really awesome going on in your spiritual life, and on the inside, it's just dead, Jesus is seeing that. And that's scary. Now it goes on. You see, Jesus, man, he's just a bag of tricks here. This is what he says next. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went on from them all. So that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. This guy's laying there and Jesus is feeling like they're like challenging him and he goes, oh, you got a problem with me forgiving sins? Well, which is easier? for me to forgive sins or to tell this guy to get up and walk, but so that you may know just how legit I am. Get up and walk. The guy skips physical therapy. He's just up. I mean, he just, whew. And I mean, can you, I think that's where Riverdance started. Because I think that only like a paralyzed man who's never really walked around would start doing, that's the only place I think you'd get that. He's just laying there next thing, whew. Hey, hey, check me out. Can you imagine how happy he was? I mean, he probably didn't realize that when Jesus forgave his sins that it was legit. He probably didn't feel that. But when he saw himself just get up and just be standing there, and can you imagine being that guy? Years of people toting you around. You've already had a pretty interesting day. And now you're just... Just standing there. What would happen? What would happen if that were to happen in this place? You see, every time you look over and you see a baptism video, there's a powerful story behind that. It is powerful. There are people's lives being changed. And it said they all went out. Did you hear that? Even the haterade drinkers walked out of church that day going, He is awesome. Jesus is awesome. What would happen? If next week when people showed up, the sermon started in the parking lot because all you good Christian people parked in Casey's and walked the rest of the way. They show up thinking nobody was at church and they walk in and it's just door to door, all locations. Everybody made the commitment. I'm bringing one person to church this week. And then they check their kids into people who are so committed to making sure that their kids get an absolutely awesome service. They walk in here, and we're just so thankful for everything that God's doing that we have folded our hands and are moving our foot side to side in worship. That's what we do, isn't it? We're just so thankful for all the things that Jesus has done. We just can't help but move our foot. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you. If you get real out of pocket, switch it up the other foot. I'm so thankful for Jesus, right? That's not how those people were. They were like, dude, he's, sa he's changed that guy. He's changing me. I'm thankful. If you walked into this place and everybody in here was worshiping because they knew that he had saved them, he had saved their friends, and he was going to save the person they invited, you walk into an atmosphere like that and you would be going, whoop, something's happening. God's changing me. I've been in those moments. You've been in those moments where worship is just so over the top that you can feel the spirit of God. I've seen it happen in Macomb. People walk in. It probably happened to you. They show up for church. They're skeptical, and they just start bawling. They're in the middle of worship. All of a sudden, just tears start. Who's doing that? It's the Holy Spirit. And when we partner with what he's doing, giving him the kind of glory he deserves, he's gonna do absolutely awesome things in our midst. We gotta, we gotta look at this story and go, you know what? 
I'm gonna be these four guys. I'm gonna bring some people to the feet of Jesus and watch what he does. We're moving to a time of decision.